a few games that have managed to marry the opposing forces of the horror game and the JRPG. The first that comes to mind is Parasite Eve or the Shadow Hearts games, but there was another that came out between those two games. It's the precursor to Shadow Hearts, and that would be Kodelka for the PS1. Kodelka was developed by Saknoth in 1997 with funding from the company SNK. Saknoth, the company headed by Hiroki Kikuda of Secret of Mana fame, was made up primarily of X Square developers. Saknoth is almost entirely known for their work on Kodelka and the Shadow Hearts games, with their only titles outside of those being Dive Alert and Fossele, both for the Neo Geo Pocket Color and both released in 1999 alongside Kodelka. Saknoth sent their team to Wales for an on-location research, and despite being headed by a Japanese development team, the game only got English voice acting, similar to the original Resident Evils. This was done to create a more grounded and realistic air to the game, being set entirely in a monastery complex in Wales during the year 1898. Kikuda's original idea for Kodelka was to span a four-part series that followed Kodelka and her descendants through the 20th century with the game's sequel again starring the titular character, and the last two following her grandson. That didn't end up happening, but it was the basis for the subsequent three Shadow Hearts games. He was heavily influenced by Celtic folklore in both the story and aesthetic of Kodelka. This influence extended it into incorporating real-world people and events such as the inclusion of Roger Bacon and the sinking of the Princess Alice. In addition to being the head of Saknoth, Kikuda was the director, producer, and composer for Kodaka. Sadly, it was also the only game in the franchise that he worked on, as he left the company soon after. Kodelka was made in the waning years of the PS1, releasing in December 1999 in Japan and just before the release of the PS2 itself in mid-2000 in North America and PAL regions. Though the PS1 was known for its 3D graphics, Kodelka used a trick that many games used at that time. Interactables and character models are in full 3D, but the backgrounds are static camera angled pre-rendered backgrounds. <laughs> However, unlike most games at the time, and especially on the PS1, Kodelka's cutscenes are done entirely through motion capture. This leads to some of the most fluid and natural cutscenes that I have ever seen in a video game, much less on a PS1, and it's actually helped by the static camera angles. During cutscenes, the smooth and natural motion of the characters is on full display at all times. There are no camera changes or cuts to hide the animation. It's just so damn well animated. The motion capture was done by Santa Monica-based studio Future Light using Hollywood-level techniques. They used the voice cast for the motion capture as well in a way Silent Hill 2 would use later on, with Kikuda flying over from Japan to oversee and direct the process himself. If you couldn't tell, I am a huge fan of the look and presentation of Kodelka, and that goes double for the music. It was composed by Kikuda using Atari Notator with influences from church music. Owing to its gothic horror roots, Kodelka uses a 34-track OST very sparingly, preferring ambient sounds in most areas when you're outside of combat. And we will get to the combat. Oh, will we get to the combat? <laughs> You start the game as the titular Kodelka, an exiled Romani medium who has been contacted by the spirit of a woman named Elaine. Kodelka, under urging from the spirit, travels and breaks into the seemingly abandoned Nebitan Monastery to investigate. She immediately encounters two individuals. One is her soon-to-be baby daddy, Edward Plunkett. The other is one of the monastery's many terrifyingly grotesque creatures with a hankering for a Kodelka sandwich. Kodelka dispatches the beast heals Edward, and then the two encounter the totally sane caretakers of the monastery, who attempt to poison them both, and succeed with Edward, who needs to be healed by Kodelka, again. Poor man can't catch a break. It's soon after that the third and final party member, Priest James O'Flaherty, is met and rescued from the clutches of a monster plant, which he is absolutely thrilled and totally thankful for. Who on earth are you two? Hey, we rescued you and that's your way of saying thanks? 
Now, Kodaka is an incredibly well-written game. You won't find any RE1-era zingers during your playthrough. That was too close. You were almost a Jill sandwich. <laughs> You're right. However, what you will find is a lot of racism, courtesy of our resident priest man. He spends almost the entire game criticizing Edward and Kodalka and insulting them to their faces, completely disbelieving them about the characters who just tried to murder them both with poison. James also literally excuses the mass slaughter and torture of innocent people purely based off of the assumption of them being criminals and immigrants. While those liars and heathens are killed is none of my concern. Yes, James literally excuses mass slaughter because the people being killed were immigrants. Even after evidence is presented to the contrary and that they weren't all criminals and immigrants. Here is a sampling of some of Priest James' greatest hits. Rubbish. All those deaths are rubbish? They're all liars and thieves anyway. You shut up and get us out of here. How hard can it be for thieves like you to get us out of a place like this? Before is ridiculous, especially when people are dying from hunger every single day in London. Oh, they're all filthy anymore, little beggars that deserve to die. Even if I were used to seeing dead bodies, I'd be vomiting. So it is that couple. But why? Fools! How could such a kind and faithful couple be cold-blooded killers? This is the work of jealousy and greed. And pagans born of savagery. Immigrants. I will not be a party to such abusive slander. Where are you from, Hamburg? Not that it really matters. You're obviously a dirty immigrant thief. Probably infected with cholera or something most of you are. None of your business! Let's to say, James is one of the reasons that I suggest losing the final boss fight on purpose. But more on that later. Kodelka has some of the most beautiful pre-rendered backgrounds this side of Resident Evil Remake that may be expected being a late-gen PS1 title, but not many pre-rendered games are being made at this point and it's a breath of fresh air to see the art form brought back. Unlike other pre-rendered games, character models and items blend in seamlessly so there's none of that, well this is obviously an interactable here. The only exception to this being the battle scenes which takes place in a flat 3D space, but more on that in the gameplay section. Some of the only downsides I found in the look and presentation of Kodelka were some odd audio glitches in some of the cutscenes. I did this most recent playthrough on the PS3 using my actual discs, so it could just be from that. Whether the audio glitching is only present in the PS3 emulation, or if it's also there on emulator, or PS1, or PS2, well, you'll just have to see my next video when I compare the best ways to play the game now, won't ya? Another weird quirk was that some of the CGI cutscenes looked like they dropped frames and had some odd slowdown, but not the actual game was lagging. It's as if the FMV itself chugged during the original export of the CGI video files because it's present no matter what way you play the game. It's most obvious in the intro FMV, but you can see slowdown in the others as well. And once you do see it, you cannot unsee it, so you're welcome. Outside of combat, the game is presented pretty closely to something you'd find in the old PS1 Resident Evil games, so I wouldn't necessarily call the controls true tank controls. With the pre-rendered backgrounds and the fixed camera angles, as well as the dark, close hallways of the monastery, one may think... Wow! What a mansion! Thank you, Wesker! Strangely, this game is one of the few times that I think the game would have been better served by having traditional tank controls. Contrary to popular belief, tank controls were not done just as a relic of the era or for limitation reasons. They were done simply because it was the best movement control scheme for the presentation. If you have ever played a game with static camera angles, yet 3D controls, you know what I'm talking about. With tank controls, forward, back, left, and right are all based on what direction the character is facing. With 3D controls, aka whatever direction you press is the one the character goes, you get tripped up when the camera angle changes, which can send the character into a wall, an enemy, or even going backwards to the previous screen. Tank controls and pre-rendered static camera angle games, match made in heaven, don't play your static camera angle game with 3D control schemes, you're going to end up having camera angle problems. Now, I mentioned that Kodelka's tank controls aren't really true tank controls. 
Now, I'm not exactly sure how to describe Kodaka's tank controls. They are sort of tank controls, but they don't 100% feel like tank controls. I'm not entirely sure how to describe it, and it's kind of hard to translate it from the footage that I have. But if you pay attention to some of the footage, you can sort of see that I have some difficulty at times with controlling her on the field. It's almost like the game feels like it was originally programmed with 3D controls in mind, but they switched to tank controls, or the other way around. It just doesn't feel as snappy as tank controls normally do in, say, Resident Evil 1 or Resident Evil 2. But, weird control issues aside, since this is obviously a horror title, that means we've got to have some spooky horror combat, right? Well, if you think that semi-tactical JRPG combat is horrific, then that would be true. That's right, like Parasite Eve, Kodelka went the route of the randomish battle coupled with a point-by level-up system that wouldn't be out of place in Final Fantasy. Battles take place in a smallish grid with our three protagonists on one end and some of the most horrifying creature designs I've ever seen in anything approaching an RPG on the other. Except the furniture. It's just... floating. There's nothing scary about floating furniture. Personally, I like the combat system, but I would be lying if I didn't tell you how much it makes the game drag out. The battle system is like Final Fantasy X's in that all the combatants take their turn in a line based on their stats, and you can manipulate the turn order with weight commands and the like. However, unlike in Final Fantasy X, you can't actually see the turn order, so it's a total guess who's going to take the turn next. Which can make it difficult to decide when to heal your party if they're low on health because you can't really see when the enemy's going to make their next turn. Then comes the slowdown. Kodelka's battle system has a massive, massive problem with slowdown. There will be times when it takes up to 10 seconds for a character to cast a spell. Not because the character animation takes that long, because it doesn't, but because the camera has to cut to that character and the game has to wait for them and the enemy's character models to pop back into reality. That means Sometimes you'll be staring for seconds at a screen of nothing before your character pops back in to cast their spell. It's like one second your character's there, then they blink out of existence, and then they blink back in to cast a spell, but the blinking back in takes entirely too long. I don't know why the game does this, if it's a culling issue with the camera change or what, but it's just one of the ways the combat drags out. Characters take far too long to get into position. They move like somebody slathered them in honey, and now they're trying to swim from one side of a pool of molasses to the other. Slowly they move into the enemy square to attack, and then slowly back out into their own square. The movement alone takes entirely too long and can leave battles dragging out. Now this doesn't seem bad, but you don't have the option to go back to a lower level of magic. While I'm on a roll completely tearing apart a battle system I just said I liked, here's another gripe. Magic levels with use. So once, say, Kodelka casts Flare enough to hit level 2 in that spell, level 1 is forever cut off from you. So what, you may ask? And to that I say MP consumption. Each level a spell increases, both the power and the MP consumption of the spell goes up, and since you can't just cast a lower level spell on a weaker enemy, you end up either wasting MP or going for physical attacks to preserve your character's MP because you can't just use the lower level spell again. Now, sure, you may ask, then I'll just use physical attacks, except the game has weapon degradation. Almost every weapon in the game outside firearms is a ticking time bomb. Once they've been used enough, BOOM! The weapon breaks and is gone forever. You can't repair them. You'll just have to get some more. Or use something else. Or use the MP you've been hoarding to cast spells on mooks when you didn't need to. This is even worse because the weapons in Kodelka are something that you level up with a character. Say... Edward's using an axe, right? Edward levels up with the axe. Edward can now hit with the axe three times in a row. Then his axe breaks. Guess what? Now he's using a dagger for a quarter of the damage that he was doing with the axe that was hitting three times. 
Now you have to level up the dagger. Oh wait, the dagger broke. Time to go use a spear that you have no levels in. Can you see why this could be annoying? All this leads to not being able to focus on leveling up one type of weapon with a character effectively, or over-focusing on magic to stop a good weapon from breaking, and inevitably leads to awful, terrible, no good weapon hoarding. Nobody likes weapon hoarding. Also, while I'm on a train here of griping about the game, one more little bad little gripe. It's so annoying to use items from the inventory screen. Using any item, say cheese, because cheese is yummy, only uses one item at a time and boots you to the main status screen, forcing you to go back to the item screen and then scroll to the item you want to use again. And you have to do that every time you use the item. So if you're having to use an item multiple times to say, heal your party or regenerate some of that MP you had to waste on a mook in a random fight, yeah, you're gonna have to do that every single time you use an item. You can't just keep using them from the item screen. And that's just rude. However, despite all that griping, I did mean it when I said I like the battle system. It has some less than ideal quirks, but the battle music is amazing and the animations are equally as well done as the cutscenes, and I am not lying when I say I haven't seen more grotesque and frankly weird character designs in a video game. Especially a video game that's supposed to be an RPG. To be completely honest, the only other game that I can think of that has a sort of similar body horror design is Xenosaga, but Xenosaga doesn't have as many of the horror elements as Kodelka does, so sort of think of Kodelka's character designs and enemy designs as if Xenosaga and Resident Evil had a baby. Then there's the other thing that makes the battles more tolerable. They're really not that frequent, especially compared to any other JRPG that I've played. This is partially due to the fact that the game's luck stat affects the frequency of the random battles, but also I think the developers wanted to subtract as little as possible from the story and the ambiance of the game, so they probably cranked down the random battle counter just a touch. I generally got into only one battle in a room if I got into a battle at all. I was frequently going several rooms in the Nemetin Monastery without getting into a single fight. And if you know what certain enemies are weak against, through either trial and error or just looking it up, battles can go by really quick in spite of the battle system's flaws. I've never really found myself underleveled at any point, with one notable, albeit optional, exception. But even in that case, the game offered a way to get around being overleveled for the optional super boss. That option is... Save items. That's right, this game gives away free items if you manage to save the game at an actual save point at specific times. And I mean specific. One of the most powerful weapons in the game, Roger's Cane, is obtained by saving the game at a permanent save point at exactly 22 hours, 22 minutes, and 22 seconds into the game. Then you restart the game, load the save, and the item will appear in your inventory. The problem is, the game is much shorter than 22 hours. For this review, I literally left the game on in the background all day until I unlocked it, after which I was entirely overpowered for the rest of the game. Now, I mentioned a permanent save point. Well, Kodelka has two types of save points, 
temporary and permanent. The temporary ones are every couple of rooms or so and denoted by an S next to the room's name when you enter. In these rooms, you can make a single temporary save, sort of like a quick save in more modern games. Permanent save points replenish your HP and MP as well as let you do an actual hard save. And these only appear in rooms that had a major boss fight and only after defeating the boss fight in the room. Permanent save points aren't really difficult to keep track of because, like the Spencer Mansion before it, the layout of Nemeton Monastery is so varied that it's pretty difficult to get lost. But even if you do, the game does give you a map, which works all right. It doesn't mark important places well at all, which is a touch annoying. But like I said, it's pretty difficult to get lost, so I never really had too much trouble with it. Especially because this game, at times, like Resident Evil before it, loves its backtracking. Again, just like the Spencer Mansion. I'm on to you, Square. I'm really jonesing for your own Resident Evil, weren't you? Kodelka is a gem of a game. I cannot state enough how good the atmosphere, the writing, the acting, both the voice and the mocap are in Kodelka. The music, just the... Did I say atmosphere? I said atmosphere. The atmosphere. The atmosphere is really good, you guys. It's, it's, it's just, it's just primo. Sure, the combat is a bit clunky, but I cannot stress enough that the rest of the game is worth it. And especially if you don't neglect the luck stat too much. The battles aren't really that much of a drain on your time. Had I not gone out of my way to defeat the optional super boss and get all the timed items, I would have only taken roughly 8 to 10 hours to beat the game, and that's while getting both endings. Did I mention the game has two endings? As promised, and with as few spoilers as possible, like Fatal Frame 2, the canon ending of this game is what most would consider the bad ending. The final boss of the game is the only determining factor in what ending you get. Win against the boss, and you get what the fandom calls the bad ending, even though it's the good ending because it's the one where you beat the boss, but it's not thematically the best ending, and it's not the canon one. Yeah, it's kind of confusing and seems pretty strange, but I'm trying not to spoil it, just trust me on this. Whichever ending you like the most really depends on you and how you think of the story and its themes, but unless you've really grinded your characters up and obtained optional weapons or defeated the super boss or just kitted yourself out, you're probably not going to defeat the final boss. Again, I keep reiterating, that spoils, but the final boss is hard. Really, really hard if you don't know what you're doing or if you didn't get the optional items. So you could just do what I did and leave your PS3 on for 12 hours so you can get all of the optional items so you can just completely kick the crap out of the final boss or be prepared to only see the canon ending that is still considered the good ending, despite being the bad ending. It's complicated. So fans of these games, don't get mad at me, I should probably mention there's technically a third ending, but it's not really an ending. Very close to the game, there's a non-standard game over that you can trigger if you don't have a plot important item that the game screams at you pretty much to pick up. If you don't pick it up, you get the non-standard game over, which some people consider a third bad ending. But it triggers a game over screen, it's not an actual ending. And the game telegraphs right before it's happening that hey, you really should make sure you have that thing that we told you to pick up and then we put in front of your face. You should probably have it. <laughs> and if you don't have it, the ending gets triggered. That's not an ending, it's a game over. So go find yourself a copy of Kodelka for the PlayStation 1. Hold up. How much is a copy going for now? And it's not available on any digital storefront? Well, that's just ridiculous! Well, whatever way you get a hold of Kodelka, it's a must-play for both horror and JRPG fans alike. And if these prices are any indication, eh, it's probably not a game you've played before. However you get a hold of Kodalka for PS1, see that you do. A world of janky gameplay and amazing gothic horror aesthetic awaits you at Nemeton Monastery. Just make sure to watch your back out there. I hear the caretakers don't take too kindly to visitors. 